All right, hi everyone, we'll get started in just a few moments here. Um, but before we get started, I just wanted to confirm with everybody that's already logged in that you can see my screen and you can hear me. Um, so if you are able to hear me talking and see my screen, if you could just let me know in the questions box of your GoToWebinar panel by typing yes, um, that would be a huge help to me. Excellent, thank you guys. All right, so uh, just bear with me for a moment. I think my uh, co-panelist from Harbor Compliance, uh, this is Linda from Mighty Cause. Um, I just wanna make sure that she is able to get logged in. Um, so hang with me for just a moment here. I'm sorry for the delay. All right, so I'm gonna just go ahead and get started. I may have to check in and make sure that my co-host is able to get logged in, um, but I don't wanna hold everyone up anymore. Um, hello, welcome to our webinar on online fundraising compliance and specifically uh, text to give This is a co-hosted webinar between Mighty Cause and Harbor Compliance. Uh, my name is Linda Gerhardt and I'm from Mighty Cause and I'm hoping that Sharon Cody from Harbor Compliance will be able to join us as a panelist shortly. So here's a look at today's agenda. Um, first, I'll be talking through text to give and the benefits of using an online fundraising platform like Mighty Cause. And then um, as soon as she's able to get logged on, I will be turning it over to Sharon um, to discuss fundraising compliance. Sharon is from Harbor Compliance. Um, so just as a bit of housekeeping, uh, we'll be doing a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So if you think of something you would like to ask while we're presenting, just type that into the questions box of your GoToWebinar panel, and we'll make sure to get to it at the end of the presentation. All right, before we kick things, kick things off, I just wanted to take a moment to talk about who I am, why you're listening to me talk, and who Mighty Cause is. For those of you who may uh, be new to Mighty Cause, who came to us from Harbor Compliance's um, circle, uh, my name is Linda Gerhardt, and I'm the Senior Community Engagement Manager here at Mighty Cause. And I've been with the company since 2016, uh, mostly running our blog and hosting webinars um, and just helping nonprofits fundraise better. That's sort of the gist of my job here. 
Um, Mighty Cause is an online fundraising platform that has been around since 2006, and we used to be actually called Razoo. Um, we are an employee-owned company based in Northern Virginia, just outside of Washington, DC, and we're one of the few online fundraising platforms in the market that is not backed by venture capitalists, so we are employee-owned. Um, we offer a full nonprofit fundraising suite, event and personal cause fundraising, and we also partner with giving events all over the country. Um, and we also host our own Giving Tuesday event every year um, at the end of the year. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that later on. Okay, so um, to dig into let's into text, text to give, let's talk about what it is, what it's all about, and how it works. So text to give is a fundraising technique that allows a donor to initiate a donation via text message. Um, and there are two main ways it can work. Um, both of them involve texting a keyword to a short code, which is a series of numbers. Sometimes it's, a, uh, it's usually a, about six numbers. Um, but what happens after that text message is sent is what makes these two different models of text to give different. Um, in traditional text to give, donors text the keyword to the short code, um, and the donation is actually made by adding that amount to the donor's phone bill. Um, and then the, the companies who collect the donations send it to um, the charities that were that the donation was intended for. Um, and typically donations for traditional text to give models are in smaller static amounts. So by texting um, a certain keyword to a short, and short code, you, um, you donate $10, $20, or whatever the amount is. Um, text to donate is another model uh, where a donor texts a keyword to a short code, but then instead of just confirming that they intend to donate, they're taken to a mobile donation form where they enter the amount they wish to give and they fill out the form. Um, text to give is something that you'll see often in fundraising campaigns that need a large scale immediate response like disaster relief. And they can also be really helpful with live events, um, which, is, which I hope we'll be able to have again shortly, very soon. Um, one of the most case, famous cases of text to give and the campaign that really kick-started it as a viable fundraising method was the American Red Cross's campaign for Hurricane Sandy relief. Um, this campaign was in 2012, and I was working at a nonprofit organization at the time, and I remember that it really just made a lot of people excited about the possibilities of text to give and wondering how they could incorporate text to give into their own fundraising. Um, how it worked was very simple. Um, they had a huge campaign where they asked people to text Red Cross to 90999 and they got another text message when they sent that text message asking them to confirm that they meant to donate $10 to the, the Red Cross. So they got affirmative consent, yes, I intend to donate this amount to this organization. Um, and that's an important thing to note in this case because donations were all for the same amount. People could donate more than once, of course, but one text to the short code was a $10 donation, which was a smaller approachable amount that opened the campaign up to a lot more people. Um, and then that amount was tacked on to their bill, which as a side note, at the time, uh, teens and some other people didn't realize because it seems like kind of a silly mistake to make, but it was this was pretty new at the time. And there were actually people who thought that the money was going to come from some other source um, or that the Red Cross was going to somehow spend that amount of money for disaster relief if they just received text messages. Um, as we all know, donors can get their wires crossed in all kinds of fascinating ways. And that was one of the pitfalls of this campaign um, that really sticks out to me. Um, but in general, it was a really massive campaign. There was a huge publicity push. Nearly every celebrity you can think of was involved in promoting it. And it was a truly viral campaign that also had a big national organization behind it with a full team of communications and public relations professionals behind it and making it uh, gain traction. And to this day, this campaign is really the one that everyone thinks of when they think about text to give because it was hugely successful, raising around $15 million for the Red Cross's um, Hurricane Sandy relief efforts. Um, now, 
it's important to note that a big reason this campaign was able to be so successful, despite the smaller donation amounts, was the sheer scale of it. Um, this campaign was inescapable in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy. It was all over the radio, TV stations, social media, and so on. It was everywhere. You couldn't turn on a TV or a radio without seeing it. Um, so lots of people donated to this campaign, and it was just a strategy to do a complete media blitz and get as many people donating as possible, which after disasters, they're generally very motivated to do. People want to help. They want something easy that they can do that makes them feel like they're getting involved and they're sending money to the right places. Um, this particular campaign was unique in a lot of ways, but it was really the big one that started the conversation at nonprofits about text to give um, When Hurricane Katrina hit in 2005, um, if you were around at the time and working for nonprofits or just paying attention, um, you'll probably remember that there were some telethons, and there were a lot of traditional fundraising methods that were used in relief for Hurricane Hurricane Katrina, and those efforts uh, in, in some cases fell short. Um, so this campaign uh, for the American Red Cross in 2012 was really a game changer for fundraising and the way that nonprofits responded to disasters, and as well as what the public expects from nonprofits who are providing disaster relief. Now, the American Red Cross campaign and text to give efforts after it reveal that there are some really big pros and kind of big pro cons to traditional text to give. Um, on the plus side, text to give makes donating to a charity as easy as sending a text message, which pretty much everyone can do, um, which means that it opens the door to a lot of people donating to charity for the first time who may not otherwise know how or feel comfortable doing it or may be intimidated by it. Um, aside from the gas of teens, texting and uh, texting and texting without really realizing that their parents would eventually end up with the bill in the American Red Cross campaign. It was simple for the public to understand. And again, the donor acquisition was just massive. It activated a lot of people to give to a charity for the very first time. So it opens up philanthropy in a way that a lot of un other fundraising methods haven't been as successful at. Um, and as for the cons, uh, donations being in static amounts is a huge one. With the American Red Cross campaign, there was no way to use text to give to make bigger donations. Um, they were for $10, so if you wanted to donate $50, you either needed to find another way to do that all at once or send five text messages, um, which kind of made the process a little bit more convoluted for people who wanted to donate um, in, a, in higher amounts. Um, and on that note, uh, donors didn't have the option to initiate a recurring donation. Um, the big thing was that it was a shock to a lot of organizations who were excited by the, the possibilities of text to give was just the cost of the short code. That was something that a lot of people were not prepared to uh, foot uh, when they learned how much it was. They are not cheap um, and they can range from hundreds of dollars per month to uh, thousands of dollars per year. So the math really just didn't add up for small and mid-sized organizations um, who were looking to incorporate text to give but really just couldn't incorporate or justify that kind of spending. Um, and the big downside in my opinion, would be the loss of donor data. A lot of those first-time donors couldn't be followed up with and uh, cultivated because a third party was processing the donations and sending the funds to the nonprofit. So as a donor cultivation tool, it really didn't work um, for a lot of organizations. Um, and this is a small thing, but sometimes text to give campaigns caused a delay in the funds actually being sent uh, because the process of actually receiving the money from the donor was on a delay. They paid it as part of their phone bill and there was a lag in getting the money to the organization that it was intended for. So it took a little bit longer for that donation to end up where it was intended to go. All right, so uh, for text to give on Mighty Cause, we offer a text to donate model, um, which means that when a donor texts your keyword, um, which you get to choose to 844-844-6844, lots of force, um, they will be texted back a link to a mobile optimized donation form. Uh, that form pulls in the settings that you've chosen from your checkout flow, so it's customizable. Um, they enter their personal and payment information as they would with any other donation. Um, and the cool thing about this being done on a phone is that if if you have an iPhone or um, a smartphone, um, a lot of it, that information can just be autofilled with just a, a, a 
fingerprint. Um, so it's really easy and doesn't have much friction for the donor. Um, they can also choose to make their donation monthly and they can choose to cover processing fees for your nonprofit. And then they just complete their donation like they would any other donation. It's processed immediately, just like any donation, and they get batched together with your other donations and are included in your regular disbursements from Mighty Cause. Um, now, one thing I want to mention is that this is how pretty much all of the major fundraising platforms operate when it comes to text to give. It's a text to donate model, not a traditional text to give model like you saw with the American Red Cross campaign. So this is in general where this space is moving to um, in, in fundraising. Um, so the benefits of this text to give model on Mighty Cause are numerous. Um, the most important one is that your nonprofit has complete ownership and control of your donor data. It is yours. It's in your donation report. You also have a separate text to give report so that you can see what donations are coming in through your, your text to give channel. Um, and you can collect pretty much whatever information you want um, so you can follow up and start stewarding that donor. It allows for recurring donations, which are extremely important especially right around this time um, and they can give in whatever amount they choose um, you have some options in your check uh, your checkout flow to customize that and give them uh, you know some suggested amounts um, but they can really enter in anything they want the platform minimum for us is five dollars um, and there is no upper limit so if somebody wants to donate five thousand dollars through um, our text to give technology they can do that um, as I mentioned the funds are just bundled into your regular disbursement um, which you can set up to receive by direct deposit. Um, and we pay for the short code. Um, that's a really big thing. So you don't have to. There's no additional cost to your nonprofit for using text to give. Um, Sharon is um, hopefully going to be logging on and talking more about this soon. But we're also compliant with fundraising regulations in all 50 states. Um, so you don't have to worry about where your donor is located and whether you're allowed to accept or solicit donations from them. Um, and you also get to choose your own keywords through Mighty Cause. So if you wanted some a general keyword and you wanted some campaign specific keywords, um, you are able to choose those through Mighty Cause. Um, the only caveat to that is that uh, two organizations can't have the same um, the, the same the same keyword. So obviously two humane societies um, can't have the same humane society keyword. They have to be unique. So that's the only caveat to being able to choose your keywords. So text to give is available to users on Mighty Cause that have a subscription to our advanced fundraising tools, um, which is just $99 per month. And yes, you can pay that every month or annually or however you want. The choice is yours. It comes with tools like custom donation forms, our CRM tool and data integration. Um, now, all users on Mighty Cause can also access a free trial of advanced um, just to test it out. And you can initiate that immediately through your organization's dashboard in your settings. Um, and during your trial, you do get one uh, keyword that you can choose to test out text to give and see how it works. Um, you can just test it out, see how it works, or you can just put it into use for a campaign if you wanted to use that one keyword during your trial. All right, and so before we get into fundraising compliance, I just wanted to quickly talk through why a fundraising platform makes fundraising easier, what we're all about, what, how this all works, and uh, why it's a great option for small and mid-sized nonprofits. On Mighty Cause donations are processed through the Mighty Cause Foundation, which is our donor advised fund or DAF. Um, when a donor on the platform makes a donation to your organization, they are advising the Mighty Cause Foundation that their donation is intended for your nonprofit, which is why your profile is connected to your tax exempt EIN. And then we batch your donations together and send them to your nonprofit as a regrant through the Mighty Cause Foundation. Um, and if this seems complicated or you're like, why is this set up that way? Um, the reason is because it makes it easier for nonprofits, especially small ones, to start fundraising without as much work to get started um, because our DAF has all of the necessary registrations and permits um, and we provide donation receipts to donors. It's basically intended to ease your administrative burden. 
The Mighty Cause Foundation's mission is to democratize fundraising and philanthropy uh, so small nonprofits and everyday philanthropists can do good with less hassle. Um, as I mentioned, uh, utilizing the DAF allows us to automate processes like sending donation receipts um, for your nonprofit, and we hold and maintain all of the necessary registration permits so nonprofits can start fundraising sooner um, with less of an effort uh, to get all of their paperwork in order and focus on raising money for your cause. Um, that infrastructure also allows you to concentrate on broadening your base of support. Um, because we use the DAF to process donations, that's why we need all nonprofits to be in the IRS master file and in good standing with the IRS or sponsored by an organization that is. Getting started on Mighty Cause is very easy. Um, you just go to mightycause.com slash nonprofits and you fill out a quick form. Um, you can find your nonprofit by your EIN, that's the number that's assigned to you by the IRS, or the name of your nonprofit, um, and give us just a little bit of information to gain administrative access to your nonprofit's profile. Um, and just to ease any fears, we do actually have our real people on staff looking at the information, just verifying that you are who you say you are and that you're able able to um, ac access your nonprofit's information and take control of your fundraising profile. Um, and then you can just start fundraising. Um, we do also have a process if you're fiscally sponsored. You can just click my nonprofit is not on Mighty Cause yet. Um, and there's a form that's a little bit longer, um, but it gives our staff the information that we need to help set up your, your organization on our platform. Um, sometimes schools and churches, because of their tax exempt status, are not in our database automatically. So that longer form may also be necessary for schools and churches, um, as well as people who are or organizations, I should say, that are fiscally sponsored. There's also a way to get started on Mighty Cause and sign up for a fundraising event at the same time, and that is by registering for our Giving Tuesday event. Um, when you go to givingtuesday.mightycause.com and register for the event, uh, you'll be given access to your organization's profile as part of that process. So two birds with one stone, and Giving Tuesday is a really great opportunity to take our fundraising tools for a test drive. Um, we also have lots of training that is totally free, that's planned um, leading up to Giving Tuesday, which is on December 1st this year. Um, that seems like a really long way off, but given that it's one of the biggest fundraising days of the year, meaning the donation volume is one of the biggest that it is all year, um, now is the time to start thinking about it. Um, so if you wanted to get started on Mighty Cause and take some of these tools for a test drive, uh, we recommend getting started by signing up to register on Giving Tuesday. All right, so let me just see if my co-host is on yet. Um, give me just a moment. All right, so it looks like Sharon is not um, able to log on yet. I'm just sort of trying to get in touch with her. Um, but since we have the time, I, I might as well just take some questions about text to give if you have any um, questions about text to give. Um, I'll just answer them while we're while we're waiting. Um, so if you have anything you want to know about text to give, if you want to pick my brains about fundraising and how to incorporate text to give into your campaign, uh, just go right ahead and type that into the questions box of your GoToWebinar panel um, and I'll start answering uh, questions. Um, and just so you all know, yeah, we are recording this webinar and we will make sure that everyone who was registered for this webinar has access to the slides and the video of the presentation. So we are recording right now um, and you'll have access to all of that. Um, how do, how do you start text to give and how much is the short code? Um, so I hope that may have been answered in the previous slides, um, but if you wanted to start text to give with Mighty Cause, it's really just as simple as either starting your trial of Mighty Cause Advance, which is our subscription service. Um, it is kind of an add-on, so you do need the subscription to access text to give through Mighty Cause, um, or you can start your free trial. If you're already on Mighty Cause, you can just do that through your dashboard. Just go to settings and then plan management, and you can act 
activate your free trial to sort of get your bearings and understand how text to give works. Um, in terms of starting a larger text to give campaign, um, that's a much, uh, I'm not too familiar with that process. The first step would be purchasing your short code. Um, and as I mentioned, those can be a, a little cost prohibitive. Um, it varies based on you know where you purchase your code, um, but they can be anywhere from a few hundred dollars per month to um, you know even more than that. I've seen them as much as like eighteen hundred dollars. So they are a little bit on the pricey side. So if you're interested in starting one uh, sort of similar to the American Red Cross, that would be your first step is purchasing that short code. Um, and that's about how much they tend to cost, but it's much more cost effective to use Mighty Cause in my opinion. And I like uh, the text to uh, text to donate model that we use better because people can just autofill their payment information and it's just as simple and easy um, with the, the smartphone technology that we have now so that they can complete their donation um, really as quickly as they would if they sent a text message and then verified the amount they wanted to donate. Um, so did the phone company get a, a cut for handling the donations? I actually don't know that. Um, I believe, um, and this is interesting because in my research, I didn't really find a straight answer to that, um, but I didn't, I wasn't entirely sure about that. Um, but I believe they were also handled through donor advised funds, but because they were, you know, there were so many of them, it's, I'm not really quite sure because it was covered by a lot of, there were a lot of phone carriers involved in that campaign. So I wasn't able to find the answer to that in my research but if you come across that information I would be interested to know so uh, text or email me at lynda at mightycost.com because I would love to know the answer to that question as well um, let's see on Mighty Cause Text to Give, does donor pay a processing fee? Um, the answer is yes. It's um, it's just our standard fees. So it depends on your plan and what you what you have going at your nonprofit. Um, generally speaking, our costs are lower than PayPal. Um, you just have to opt into our um, our our pricing guarantee, and that will that will bring the cost down to no more than uh, two point two percent plus 29 cents per donation, and that includes everything. So um, take a look at our pricing guarantee. You can activate that through your um, your profile in your dashboard. Um, so just make sure that you opt into that because we're cheaper than PayPal. Um, if you don't have that opted in or you're participating in something else like a giving event, which has its own fee structure, um, then those fees would apply. But um, as I mentioned, the, the donor does have the option to cover those fees for you. They will see the amount that that costs when they are checking out. So it's typically not very much. It's usually a few dollars from the average donor who's giving you know, somewhere in the, the $10 to, to $50 range. So they're able to see that and go, oh, okay, that's just, a, that's just a little bit of extra money and it'll help the nonprofit get the full amount. So I believe um, around a third of, of donors on our platform opt to cover fees. Um, so just make sure that you're opted into our pricing guarantee and it will be cheaper than using a PayPal button to use text to give. Um, and then obviously you have the cost of um, paying for an advanced subscription as well. So there are some costs involved just because the technology, you know, we have to maintain it. We have to make sure it's in good working order. Um, and, you know, we have to manage all of the keywords that people choose through the platform. So there are some fees involved, but they are definitely not as exorbitant as uh, purchasing your own short code, for instance. All right, is there a minimum amount of time you need to subscribe? Um, great question. Um, for example, can you just use the system for a month for a particular event? Um, yeah, I mean, there's really, you're not locked in. You can choose when you check out if you would like to pay for a year of advanced or whether you would like to just pay per month. And there, you're not you're not roped into it. If you want to cancel your plan, you can cancel your plan. So if you just have an event coming up where you want to utilize advanced tools, then you can certainly, um, you know, subscribe for a shorter period of time or however long it's useful for you. I believe it's, a, it's slightly cheaper um, if you do purchase the full year. That way you're charged once and you have it through for the whole year and I'm not sure offhand what the threshold is for um, 
fundraising, but in, in the process of fundraising throughout the year, a lot of nonprofits kind of balance that out and they more than pay for the cost and what they bring in in donations. Um, so yeah, you can you can use it for just a big campaign if you wanted to subscribe for a little while, um, or you can pay annually if you wanted to do that, um, or you can just sort of sign up and see how it goes, but there's no contract that's locking you in to Mighty Cause Advanced. Um, so th there's a couple of questions about fees. I hope that they're, they, I answered those, um, but if you go to mightycause.com slash pricing, um, you can see all of this broken down with all of the fine print, um, but we're cheaper than PayPal to use. Um, so if you have a PayPal button on your site, you can get a lot more just by signing up for Mighty Cause. And if you pay the $99 per month for advance, you get access to text to give and you get access to a CRM tool so you can you know, sort of up the ante with your donor management. We also have some integrations available, like integrations with Salesforce. Um, that's all done through Zapier um, that can allow you to do some really cool things that allow you to automate processes. Um, but go to mightycause.com slash pricing if you want like the full rundown of fees, but we're 2.2% uh, plus 29 cents if you are opted into our pricing guarantee. Um, so that's cheaper than a PayPal button and there's no hidden fees or anything tacked onto that. So, um, but it is a little bit, you know, there's some fine print there in terms of how that pricing guarantee works. We're not pulling the wool over your eyes. It's all right there for you to see, um, but it's more than I can recall <laughs> just stuff that's off the top of my head so just check that out if you really wanted to dive into how our pricing works but there's nothing on top of that the you know standard processing fees um, and then the the $99 per month subscription um, oh is the nonprofit responsible for marketing the text to give and promoting giving Tuesday um, so yeah you are responsible for promoting your own keyword and telling your donors how to give to you and also promoting your Giving Tuesday campaign. Um, we typically have you know, thousands of nonprofits who are participating in Giving Tuesday. So typically what happens, most of the traffic is from direct links. So that means a donor received an email or saw a social media post from your nonprofit um, or saw somebody in their social network sharing a link to your Giving Tuesday campaign and then they made uh, they clicked on that and went to your page and made a donation um, so that is where most of our donations come from on Giving Tuesday is the nonprofit proactively promoting their campaign um, and we do have some information we have a whole tool toolkit that's available that kind of breaks down um, how to market your campaign it's usually just a, an integrated strategy of using social media channels email marketing, um, and whatever works for your nonprofit for any other type of campaign. Um, so yeah, I mean, you're responsible for marketing it because our search is gonna have thousands. There's a, a you know definitely filters people can use. So if somebody goes to our Giving Tuesday site and they wanna find animal nonprofits in the state of Maryland or whatever their interest may be, they can certainly find nonprofits that way. But most donors um, give just in general in nonprofits fundraising as a whole, they give because somebody directly asks them to. Um, so we don't market for you, we don't provide marketing services, but we do um, you know, provide every, everything you need as well as a toolkit, templates, um, and a timeline just so you uh, are able to structure your campaign without a lot of extra, extra lift. It's really very simple and people are gonna be giving on Giving Tuesday, so it's just important to make sure that your nonprofit's name is in the mix and people are motivated to give to you. All right. Um, so more questions about fees. If you guys have any questions like about fees, if you're, you want to let me know what your situation is or you want some links, um, feel free to email me. My email address is Linda at mightycause.com. Uh, so you can feel free to email me if you have like some some questions or you're not quite understanding um, the fee structure, the pricing page, mightycause.com slash pricing really spells it all out for you. So that's the best place to go if you're curious about pricing. Um, did you say the keywords are held by Mighty Cause? We cannot create our own. So, yes and no. So they are uh, owned by Mighty Cause uh, because it's through our platform. So, uh, for instance, if two people want to do, two nonprofits want to do the keyword give, um, that creates a conflict in our system. So you are able to create your own keyword. Like I want to make that perfectly clear. You can use a keyword um, that you choose. It just can't be a duplicate so that usually means that you just sort of need to customize it in some way so like if i worked 
for, um, this is not a real animal shelter as far as I'm aware, but I'm in Virginia. So if I worked for the Virginia Humane Society, if I worked for that animal shelter and I wanted to create my keyword, instead of using like humane society or animals or whatever uh, keyword I was looking to use, um, I would instead probably choose VA Humane Society. That's easy to remember, but it also makes it unique so that it's specific to my organization. Um, so a lot of the really popular keywords that people wanna use, like give, donate, help, those sorts of things, um, that we we just don't have them available. So you can create your own keyword. Um, it's just sort of like a URL on Mighty Cause. You need to make it unique because we can't have the same thing going in multiple different directions. So they're through our platform. So we we sort of, you know, it's our technology. Um, it's your keyword though. You just need to make sure that it's a unique keyword so that we can make sure that the donations get to the correct place. Um, let's see. Some more subscription questions. Um, so there's a, a question about, is it a monthly subscription or is it a year You can and can you cancel any time? Um, it's whatever you want. If you want an animal, annual subscription, you can have one. If you want a monthly subscription, you can have one of those and you can cancel at any time. We're not gonna give you any penalties and we're not gonna uh, tell you no at the very most. We might just ask you, hey, is there anything that you know wasn't up to your liking? Um, and you'll be assigned account, an account manager as well when you sign up for advanced. So you'll have a contact at Mighty Cause um, who will probably reach out to you and you know talk to you about what your needs are. And if you want, you know, just a campaign, then we'll we'll know that up front. Or you will just we might just email you if we see that you cancel and go, hey, is everything okay? So that's there's no guilt. There's no uh, contract that we're going to lock you into. It's we just you know want people to take advantage of these tools, um, and the subscription model is how we are best able to provide them to you. Um, let's see, it's a lot of questions. Um, if you don't use text to give, what are the other ways you can use Mighty Cause to accept donations? Um, so yeah, we have a widget. We have um, you can. You know, you put that on your website and collect donations there. Uh, we have teams and event fundraising. Um, so if you wanted to do a peer-to-peer -peer campaign, you could um, use that. Um, you could, you know, start peer-to-peer -peer fundraising and collect donations through those pages as well. Um, you know, we have giving events that people participate in. Giving Tuesday is one, but we have them all over the country. We partner with usually community foundations, um, and that is the giving event model. So there's a lot of different things that you can do to collect donations. Um, it really is a great way to make your fundraising strategy more robust. Um, let's see. Um, we use Mighty Cause now, I believe, under the free option. Um, do we need to pay for a subscription and then pay the additional $99 per month for the advanced option? Oh, so just to clarify, um, advanced is the $99 per month subscription fee, so there's nothing beyond that $99 per month. Um, so it's just the one thing. It's either free or it's $99 per month. Um, and yeah, so for clarity, donors will be able to choose how much they want to give with one text. Um, no. So what they do is they text their keyword and then we send them a link where they complete a donation form and they can tell us um, how much they want to give. Um, so it, it takes you to our mobile optimized donation form and they can just tell us how much they want to give. You can have some preloaded options there. So, you know, if you wanted to do $25, $50, 75 and 100 as your four um, suggested donation amounts, they can choose from those or they can uh, you know, make a custom amount, but uh, it takes them to a donation page where they make some of those decisions, as well as being able to decide whether or not they want to make their donation recurring. Um, let's see. Um, can you talk more about recurring donations? How does that work for the donor? Do they get a text every month before they're charged? Um, I would actually recommend we have a new resource center. Um, it's mightycause.com slash guide, and there is a webinar library in there. And we actually just did some, uh, we did a, a whole webinar about uh, recurring donations. Um, but how a recurring donation works is that it recurs every month um, on the, same day. They can also alter that. So if they need to change up the day or change up their card, they are more than welcome to do that through the Mighty Cost platform. And they do get an email um, before their donation process is letting them know this donation is coming up. Um, and they'll also get emailed if like they're, you know, 
their card is declined or it's expired, uh, we will alert them to that so that they can go in and make the necessary changes. Um, but yeah, we try our best to keep them in the loop about what's happening with their donation and let them know it's in process. It happens on the same day but they can they can switch that up if they need to change the day for whatever reason um and yeah so it's a uh, it's pretty it's like it's it's not really that much different than your netflix subscription they you know are notified when it's in process it hits their account they can cancel at any time and they can also change it up um, which you can't do with a lot of uh, subscription services so um it's really easy for them to manage through um mighty cause um, how long do disbursements take? Um, so if you have direct deposit or EFT set up, you will get a disbursement twice per month um, on the first, uh, I'm sorry, on the 15th and the 31st, I believe. So you'll get a direct deposit into your nonprofit's bank account twice per month. Um, so you'll start getting those um, as soon as you have donations stored up. We sort of batch them together twice a month and we send them straight to your nonprofit. Um, if you're getting them by check, um, they are sent once per month. So they are sent on the 10th and then they, uh, you know, they're in the mail, so they will get to you shortly thereafter. Um, but we definitely recommend uh, disbursement, uh, as EFT disbursements, just so it's easier for you to manage that. Um, how long are the short codes good for once purchased? I'm actually not sure. I think as long as you pay for them, it's yours. Um, so if you lay out the money for your own short code outside of Mighty Cause, I believe they're good for as long as you would like to continue paying for them. Um, as far as keywords on Mighty Cause, I believe they are good for as you know as long as you have the subscription. Eventually, if you you know how you get rid of advanced and you don't want to use text to give anymore, uh, we would probably free up those keywords if they're not being utilized by use just so somebody else can uh, have access to them. Um, let's see. Just wanted to confirm that the owner does not need to have their own DAF to donate. Great question, absolutely not. The Mighty Cause Foundation is the DAF. So the DAF is sort of the middle person between you and the donor. Uh, donor makes a donation, it goes through the DAF and then is re-granted to your nonprofit. Um, donors can definitely set up their own DAFs, but that is a much higher level of donor than we usually have on Mighty Cause. So they don't need their own DAF. Uh, the Mighty Cause Foundation is the DAF. Um, so you don't need to set up anything. The donor doesn't need to set up anything. Um, it's just the Mighty Cause Foundation is the DAF that is utilized when you use Mighty Cause. Um, is there a limit to the number of text messages an org can send at one time? Um, that's a great question because there's actually another thing that organizations ask us for when it comes to text to give, um, and that is, can we send push notifications? That's actually a completely different kind of service, so we don't offer that. Um, text to give is that you have a short code or the, sh the, the number that we provide for you, you have a keyword and you publicize it to your donors and then they text the keyword to the, the number, and that's the, the service. Push notifications are a little bit different. Um, so that's a completely different service that we do not offer. Um, SMS or push notifications are what you would want to Google if you want more information about that. At this point, we don't offer that service just because it's a, you know, it's, it, we don't have, we, we're, we can only be so many things at once, uh, more or less. Um, but that is something that is available. SMS or push don't notifications are what you would like to Google there if you want to learn more about that. Um, I assume that the text to donate donations are differentiated in some manner in the disbursement reports. They absolutely are. Um, so you have access to a lot of reports on Mighty Cause and you will have a specific um, text to give donation report. So you'll be able to see which donations came in from that channel. So when you're sitting down and you're evaluating, um, you know, your your nonprofit's spending, you can see how much you're actually bringing in through text to give and make sure that you're making that, um, you know, that you're utilizing that. Um, how does the text to donate donor receive their gift tax substantiation language? That's a great question. We email them a receipt. So as part of the process of making their donation, um, they will give us their email address and we'll send them a receipt. So they, it's all taken care of. You don't have to do any extra thing. We um, email them immediately. Um, let's see, oh, and we have Sharon here. Sharon, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, hi, how are you? Good, thanks. Um, so, sorry we missed you. I was just answering some uh, questions about text to give, um, but uh, I'll go ahead and I'll turn uh, the turn everything turn the presentation over to you. Are you good? Yeah, that's great. If you want to let me um, uh, 
manage the screen from my end, we can start. All right, I am making you the presenter and I will put myself on mute. Super, thank you. Okay, everybody. Sorry for hopping on a little late. I had some technical difficulties, but I'm glad to be joining you now. My name is Sharon Cody, and I'm the Nonprofit Partnership Manager at Harbor Compliance. And at Harbor Compliance, we partner with organizations in every state and over two dozen countries um, to help them with their challenging um, compliance problems. To date, we've helped more than 25,000 clients manage government licensing. And here you'll see some of our nonprofit partners that we've helped keep compliant. Okay, so on my end, here's what we're gonna learn about. We're gonna learn where fundraising is regulated, which traditional and online activities, um, fundraising activities trigger registration requirements, how to use fundraising compliance to build trust and raise funds, and then how to navigate and manage fundraising registration and reporting on an ongoing basis. Okay, so let's take a look at um, this quote here from the IRS. Um, first, charitable solicitation compliance. In its simplest terms, charitable solicitation is fundraising, and the IRS is the regulator of nonprofit status, but the states are the regulators of fundraising. The most important word in this quote from the IRS is the word before. Generally, charities are required to register before they begin soliciting. Uh, California is an exception. You have 30 days um, from receipt of a gift to register, but in almost every other state, um, you need to be registered to solicit before you begin fundraising. Um, this is because uh, charitable solicitations or requirements are based on the act of solicitation, not on the receipt of donations. So it doesn't matter whether you receive a gift in response to your fundraising. What matters uh, is that you are fundraising and it is the fundraising that triggers your obligation to register. So, do these requirements apply to you and apply to text to give? So solicitation, um, the definition varies slightly from state to state, but um, generally uh, charitable solicitation requirements apply uh, whether you're asking for donations by traditional or online methods. So whether you're asking in person uh, with direct mail, making a phone call, an email, text to give, you have a website donate button, um, you're asking uh, during a giving day or a virtual event, all of these methods of fundraising are solicitation, regardless of the methods you use to ask for funds. Um, here we go. Uh, there's some additional methods of regulated fundraising uh, that states um, also have requirements. Um, cost marketing or commercial co-ventures done with um, corporate partners. Um, and also, uh, if you're working with a fundraising council or professional fundraiser, they have obligations to register in many states and also file your fundraising contract with them, with the state, uh, as well as follow up reports. Um, and as many of you know, auctions and games of chance also have licensing requirements often on the municipal uh, level rather than the state level. Okay. Um, we were just hearing about text to give and text to donate, and it makes so much sense because people, their devices uh, are mobile, and so why shouldn't fundraising be too? But it's important to understand that solicitations occur where they are received by the prospective donors. That's correct. It's the location of the potential donor that determines in which state your solicitation occurs. This map shows the states that regulate fundraising. The 41 states shaded in dark blue or orange require charities to register to solicit nearly all before solicitation occurs, as we just discussed. Those states in orange require charities to not only register, but also require charities to include disclosure statements on their solicitations and other donor correspondence. 
those two states in light blue do not require fundraising registration, but do require fundraising disclosures. Uh, the states in dark blue require charities to register to solicit, but do not require disclosure statements. And then those states in white, the handful of states in white, do not regulate fundraising at present. Um, so it's always good to keep an eye on that because um, states do uh, uh, decide to regulate fundraising and also to stop regulate fundraising. Okay, so text to give and text to donate. Most state laws do not address registration requirements for text to give or online fundraising methods because state laws were generally written before the advent of the internet. Um, it's simple enough for you to know where your solicitation is received when you send a letter or submit a grant, but when you're soliciting online, it can be more complicated because as we talked about, your donors are mobile uh, and they have their devices with them as they travel. Um, and when you're online, you're not sure all the time where your prospective donors are located. So um, that's the appeal really uh, of uh, online fundraising and text to give. Um, you can reach donors everywhere in every state, but does this mean you need to register nationwide? The answer varies, but it may be yes for many, but not all of you. Um, nonprofit fundraising, nonprofits who are fundraising online really need to research the rules in each state. Generally, you will need to register or file an exemption in each one of the 41 states that regulate fundraising. Um, exemptions are not automatic in most states, and they are given to um, certain narrow category of nonprofits based largely on the type of nonprofit, um, its solicitation methods, and its total annual revenue. For example, very small nonprofits, um, those that raise less than 10 or $15,000 a year total, um, not in a state, but from any state, are often exempted from fundraising registration. Um, houses of worship, schools, and hospitals are exempt in some states, but not in other states. Exemptions from registration uh, have to be applied for in most states. And it's important to know that once your nonprofit is registered or granted an exemption, you will need to submit uh, a Secretary of State annual report each year usually detailing your fundraising activities um, so the state can keep track of you. Now, there's another reason besides your legal obligation to register to fundraise. Consumers, donors. Um, consumers are told to research before they donate. Here's two examples. Um, the Federal Trade Commission talking about uh, advising donors to research before giving to a charity. And then here's another quote, the same quote appears on both Arizona Attorney General's website and the Colorado Secretary of State's website. Um, if you receive an email or text message asking for a donation, confirm the request is from the charity, not an imposter, by contacting the charity or visiting its website. Um, the other way consumers research online before donating um, is to go to uh, the state's own database. Uh, most states maintain a database where uh, any nonprofits that were at any point registered with the state uh, are indexed there, and information appears as to whether that nonprofit is currently registered and in good standing in the state, whether it is not registered in the state, or whether it, it was once registered in the state and now is no longer in good standing. So with a click of a button, consumers uh, can find that information. So compliance is the law and a governance best practice, uh, and it's essential to protecting your leaders, your staff, your brand, your reputation, but it, it's also essential to donor trust. Give.org's 2019 State of Trust in the Charitable Sector study found that only 19% of respondents reported highly trusting charities. That's sad, only 19%. Um, and the study also found that nearly 70% of respondents 
rated the importance of trusting a charity as essential or nearly essential to making a gift. Another study by Fidelity Charitable on overcoming barriers to giving found the number one concern of donors is making sure nonprofits were credible and trustworthy. Every fundraiser knows that trust is key to donor giving. Um, sadly, copycat nonprofits with lookalike websites often emerge during challenging times like those we're currently facing. Um, and the public receives messages from the state attorney generals or secretary of states, the um, consumer uh, bureaus of different states, and organizations like the AARP uh, and Better Business Bureau to, reminding them to research online before donating. Uh, and the public heeds these messages. Um, 25 states require charities to include specific disclosure language in their solicitations. Um, it's a pretty common way to regulate fundraising by states. Um, it helps donors make informed decisions about their giving. Um, these disclosure statements uh, are mandated on donor correspondence, including all solicitations and donor correspondence and receipt. But a lot of nonprofits fail to include state mandated disclosures or bury them in the most inconspicuous place they can find in tiny, tiny font. Um, and it's no wonder. Here's Pennsylvania's disclosure statement. Um, dry? Yes. But despite this, uh, I'm going to urge you not to hide those mandated state fundraising disclosures because they are the perfect opportunity to let the public know your nonprofit is appropriately registered with the state and legally permitted to fundraise. Um, that kind of message shouldn't be hidden, but should be broadcast to your current and prospective supporters. Um, studies show that charities that include their state mandated disclosure statements and solicitations get a better rate of return because donors gain reassurance from the fact that the nonprofit they're giving to is accountable, transparent, compliant with laws and best practices. So take advantage of the opportunity to do the right thing, comply with your legal uh, obligation to put the fundraising disclosure statements on your website and solicitations and use it to win trust and boost donations. Um, a study from Next After found that disciplined reinforcement of a donor's decision to give resulted in a 31.3% increase in donations. Your donors are generous people with busy lives who are navigating an increasingly complicated world make their decision to give to you as easy as possible and reassure that their investment in you and your mission-driven work is a good one. Um, take those boring state disclosure statements um, and add a headline to provide some context, like our commitment to good stewardship or fully registered and compliant, and add a few sentences saying that your nonprofit is committed to responsible governance, financial transparency, and maintaining good standing. Um, it differentiates your nonprofits from others. Um, for text to give solicitations, you can easily include a link to a page on your website where you provide all of your state required disclosure statements um, and other information too, like your nonprofit status and EIN number. Um, maybe your current um, annual community report. Okay, so we talked about why compliance should be a priority for nonprofits. Um, besides being a legal obligation, it safeguards and strengthens reputations and broadcasts your commitment to best practices. It distinguishes yourself in a crowded playing field, builds your donor trust and loyalty, um, facilitates new partnerships uh, with funders and sponsors and has the potential to increase revenue and therefore impact. Um, embracing fundraising compliance as a badge of honor really can um, strengthen your nonprofit in, in so many ways. Okay. Two practical approaches to online fundraising registration, right? When you're when you're engaging in text to give and other methods of online fundraising, and you're not sure where your message is going, and you're asking donors in many states, um, what do you do? There are two options. 
You can register or file an exemption from registration if you're one of those nonprofits that doesn't need to register in a particular state. Um, and all of the 41 states, and when I say 41 states, it's really 40 states in the District of Columbia, but for um, purposes of, of today, we're gonna call it 41 states. Or um, your nonprofit can not accept donations in states in which you're not registered. Um, Obviously, not all nonprofits uh, have the financial ability to register in every state. Um, budgetary constraints are a common challenge, especially for smaller charities uh, and newer charities. For these organizations, a second approach might be better. Um, the organization uh, really needs to weigh the opportunity cost of um, registering in a state and the not being able to accept donations there. Um, to determine which of these states um, they're, they're going to go ahead and register in. What about the registration process itself? Um, we talked a lot about uh, what's required, but how to do it. Um, really, you can think of it as four basic phases, research, apply, monitor, renew. Um, it's important to learn not only what the laws are in a state and whether you're obligated to register there or your an exemption is appropriate and you can apply for that um, but you also need to understand if you're currently registered or if your nonprofit was once registered and fell out of compliance um, nonprofit turnover is a problem i know i spent much of my life working for nonprofits and sometimes nonprofits aren't always aware of where they're currently registered or where they were once registered and um, stopped filing their annual report so you need to do your research once you've done that research it's time to apply um, you often need to uh, include additional documentation with your application such as your um, 501c3 status letter uh, and a recent 990 along with a, a unique state application. Once your applications are submitted, you have to monitor uh, to see them through to approval. Sometimes it takes a few weeks, other times it's months. Um, and you will have to resubmit in a state if your application is rejected, and that does happen. Um, fundraising compliance is an ongoing obligation, so even once your applications have been accepted, states require you to renew the registrations usually every year and file an annual uh, Secretary of State report in most states. Tracking the renewal dates, which vary from state to state, and making sure your reports are filed on time is extremely important to avoid fines and late fees. Um, with this in mind, let's talk about managing compliance on an ongoing basis. So um, you should expect to spend a great deal of time tracking, preparing and tracking your renewals and filing reports each year with all the different states where you're registered. Um, and you should also uh, plan to spend some time staying abreast of any legislative changes um, and monitoring what the reporting requirements and due dates uh, are because those change as well. Um, you need an accurate filing system, um, a calendar system, um, time to pre prepare and update uh, disclosure statements and annual reports, um, and time to make sure you research um, all these legislative changes. There's a particularly important piece of legislation pending in California now that Harbor Compliance is monitoring because it's going to subject uh, many more nonprofits to register in the state if it passes. I'm sure this is a question on all of your minds. What does it cost? State fees to register for nonprofits come to somewhere between $1,400 and $5,000 for most organizations. And that is the total to register in all 41 states that require registration. Uh, Nonprofits with less than $100,000 in total gross annual revenue will fall on the low end of the range. Nonprofits with more than a million in total annual gross revenue will uh, pay total state registration fees at that high end of the range. And nonprofits with gross revenue um, of uh, $500,000 are going to fall somewhere in the middle. Okay. So we talked about how to manage fundraising uh, compliance yourself, but there's another option. Um, 
if you're not, your charity is not interested in um, putting in the hundreds of hours of work to both initially and ongoing to, that's required to manage this process, um, if you're not staffed to do that, um, you can outsource management of charitable solicitation registration. It's an efficient and effective solution. Um, Harper Compliance's alternative is to fully manage every step of the process. We do the research, we prepare the applications, we cut the checks to the states, we compile all the documents, mail or email the application and renewal packages, follow up with the states, monitor approvals, and then load all of the information into tracking software and just send you registration approvals. We really do reduce every possible bit of administrative work uh, for all the nonprofits we work with. We have software uh, that provides total visibility into registration, state fees, and renewal dates. It offers multiple levels of access and various permission levels, so colleagues within your organization can stay updated on your registration status in every state. Um, accountants, other consultants, board members can be given permission to view your current compliance status state by state. Our portal allows you to add as many users as you'd like uh, without any additional fees. Okay, so here's the key takeaways when you're talking about fundraising compliance for online and text to give. Um, Online fundraising, text to give fundraising may require nationwide fundraising registration for some nonprofits, but not all. You need to go state by state to make that determination. Next takeaway is to communicate your fundraising compliance, to build trust and raise funds, to build out a page on your website that provides all your disclosure and other information about you for donors that are looking. The third takeaway is that you need to track and review state fundraising registration reporting obligations um, and changes to legislation. And then the final takeaway is this is a complicated process and managing it yourself is resource intensive. So for many of you, outsourcing compliance to a service provider like Harbor Compliance can be an efficient alternative that lets your staff go back to what they do best. Uh, mission-driven work. Okay, does anybody have any questions for me? I'm not sure I can see the questions. I think I have to wait for Linda. Um, oh, to... sorry about that. There are definitely questions Great. for you. And I'm so sorry about the confusion. I think you were, uh, GoToWebinar was hiding you under the attendees. And so I was like waiting for you under staff and didn't see you. So um, apology, apologies for the confusion, but so glad that you were able to, to get logged on so that I could see you. Um, see. So there are some questions for you. Somebody asked if you could repeat the part about what constitutes where the fundraising is taking place. Right, so two important things to understand are that states require registration to be before you begin fundraising in a state. So before your fundraising campaign begins in a state, nearly every state requires you to first be registered there. Um, and then the second part that's important to understand is that fundraising occurs, the solicitation occurs not in your location, but in the location of the donor. So with something like text to give or other online fundraising methods, where is the solicitation occurring? It's recurring wherever these many donors are located. And because donors are mobile and their devices are mobile, that can be in many, many states. Um, and that's the beauty of it, that you can reach people where they are uh, and communicate with them where they are and make it easy for them to give to you where they are. But you don't always know necessarily uh, where they are. Um, and so you need, really need to keep track of that. Um, and then you need to Take a look at all those states' regulations and laws to determine um, are you one of the nonprofits um, that is allowed to file for an exemption in that state, or is your fundraising um, subject to regulation in that state? Some states do specifically say how much money um, 
you need to raise an estate or how many donors you need to interact with an estate um, to before you're required to register there. But it's complicated because for most states, the laws in each state were written before the advent of the internet. So you're really taking a look at um, general language and law and trying to figure out how it applies to um, uh, online fundraising and, and text to give. But the answer is if you are interacting with a, you know, a number of donors in a state, um, asking them to give to you um, through text to give or text to donate and then following up with them and sending them newsletters and email solicitations. Um, in most of those states, you will be required to register unless you're in a category that's subject to exemption. Awesome. There's lots of questions, Sharon. So just to, to give you a heads up, we have lots of questions. Um, the next one is, do you have to register in a state if your fundraising is to a foundation legally domiciled in a state, but that makes grants in many states? Yeah, so um, grant applications are a form of solicitation. So if you are soliciting um, uh, a funder in a state, you should first be registered in that state. Yes. Awesome. The next question is, does a 501c3 indicate that you are registered? No. So getting your 501c3 status from the federal government, from the IRS, um, allows you to give um, tax deductions to your donors. Um, and being granted nonprofit status by the federal government is completely different from being registered to fundraise in a particular state. Um, you could go, for example, to engineering school, architecture school, um, or um, hairdresser school uh, and receive your license um, to be an architect, an engineer, uh, or a hairdresser. But to do those things in a particular state, you need to get a license. And it's no different with fundraising. Um, before you can uh, engage in fundraising in a state, you need a license, you need to register to fundraise. Um, and unfortunately, that's how the US is. We're a, we have a federalist system and each state has its own different regulations. Um, art, architects and engineers with large, um, uh, you know, um, multi-state um, organizations require many licenses and it's the same thing with nonprofits. You may require licenses, 41 different licenses, many nonprofits do. Um, what about donors giving internationally? Uh, well, it, it depends. Are you talking about um, you soliciting donors internationally or donors from uh, international finding you and making donations. Um, you know, you accepting gifts from uh, a country where um, you have not been soliciting, I can't really speak to that. But I can tell you that many, many countries have um, uh, similar registration requirements to the states in the United States as far as fundraising registration. I was at a, um, National Association of State Charity Official um, annual conference uh, earlier this year. Um, and uh, there at the conference, we had the uh, charity officials from three different countries talking to us about their regulation. So it's pretty common for other countries um, to have similar uh, fundraising registration requirements. So if you are actively soliciting donors um, in other countries, you may need to file um, registration in those other countries as well. As far as international um, uh, nonprofits who want to fundraise in the United States, they need uh, registration, fundraising registration in each individual state. And uh, they also need to set up, uh, a, you know, a U.S. nonprofit, a Friends of organization um, to do that fundraising. So that can get a little complicated. Yeah, and that's actually one of the um, situations where on Mighty Cause we see international organizations, if they don't have a Friends of organization that is, you know, operating in the United States, um, they sometimes will work with a fiscal sponsor to, um, 
you know, who has a similar mission um, in order to be able to fundraise tax exempt in the United States. So that's one of the circumstances under which fiscal sponsorship um, can come into play on Mighty Cause. Yeah, um, and that's wonderful. And if you have suggestions for fiscal sponsors um, to ha help them find, um, you know, there's an internet search. There's a lot of organizations um, that are willing to do uh, fiscal sponsorship if, if they share a mission with you. That's de that's definitely another option. Yeah, definitely. Um, so this one is actually an interesting question I'd love to know the answer to. Um, do social media posts count as a form of solicitation that may require a disclosure statement? If so, does the language like learn more at xyz.org with a link that leads to a website, web, web page with the disclosure, this disclosure statement count? Yeah, so um, most states have not really um, addressed whether um, uh, a link to a web page is adequate, but I know no state that has said it is inadequate, if that makes a sense. Um, because as I said, most state laws are so um, old, they were put in place for uh, traditional fundraising methods. Um, you really sort of have to extrapolate out how the law would apply um, to online methods like text to give and social media. But uh, solicitation is a solicitation is a solicitation. Almost every state's definition is the same. It's basically um, asking for funds for a charitable purpose, no matter how you do it. Um, and if you, nonprofit, are the one doing the soliciting, um, then you need to include those state mandated disclosures. Um, and I think um, a, a link is probably an appropriate way um, to go about doing that. And I urge you just to um, think of that linked page um, not as an obligation, but really as a marketing opportunity to share more information about your nonprofit um, and your good work and also your commitment to accountability and transparency. And uh, one thing I did want to just add about disclosure statements is that um, you have area on your Mighty Cause profile if you are using it for fundraising. Um, we have a lot of small nonprofits who don't actually have their own web page. So some of the information is baked in um, to the profile. People are able to easily see your EIN, your legal address, the legal name of your organization. Um, and then you also have an area where if you have some state specific disclosure statements that you want to include, you can just put that text into the story on your organization's page um, in your profile so that way it's easy for for users to um, access that so that's another option um, if you wanted to use utilize your mighty cause profile for that specific purpose um, so the next question is is there a donation minimum that triggers reporting or is it any amount of donation so um so there are a handful of states where there is um some guidance on how much money you, you or how many donors you have to raise from a state. But really, um, the question is, it's sort of a, 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 a legal issue. It's whether the state has jurisdiction over your nonprofit. And to figure out whether a state has jurisdiction over your nonprofit, um, it looks at whether you've had sufficient contact with the state and to determine that generally the states look at um, how many people within the state you're interacting with and um, if you're doing it in a repeated and ongoing way so if you have a, a dozen two dozen donors in the state um, and you are interacting with them and not just asking not just accepting one gift from them but sending them a thank you uh and in the thank you you're putting a fundraising envelope and you're um asking them for uh, more money a month or two or three or four down the road and my goodness i hope that you are that's the whole point of fundraising right to raise funds um most states are going to view you as having sufficient contact with that state um, for them to have jurisdiction over you and your fundraising and require you to be registered there. If you receive a one-time gift out of a, the blue and you don't follow up with that donor and ask them for more money, then I would say in that unusual instance, um, perhaps you are not having uh, enough contacts with the state for them to regulate your fundraising. But really, you know, 
if you were to get a donation from somebody out of the blue and not follow up with them, shame on you. <laughs> Right, because that's the whole point of doing things like text to give and text to donate is to keep broadening your circle of supporters. Absolutely. Um, so this next question is sort of a joint question. I'll try to answer it um, because it's about Mighty Cause, and then Sharon, if you have any anything to add to that, please uh, feel free to pipe in. Um, so, does Mighty Cause take care of all fundraising compliance management for its users? Um, so, what I want to sort of clarify is that. When a donor makes a donation on Mighty Cause, it is a donation to Mighty, the Mighty Cause Foundation, our national donor advised fund, and they are advising that donation for your nonprofit. So it's technically a regrant. So the donation is made to the Mighty Cause Foundation. The donor tells us by making the donation through our site to your specific page connected to your EIN that it is advised for your nonprofit and then we send it as a regrant. That's technically what your disbursements are. So we do have the necessary permits and registrations in all 50 states um, to serve that purpose. However, I will say um, it doesn't hurt to check in with your, your nonprofit's lawyer um, just to make sure that you are covering all of your bases um, and to make sure that there, your state doesn't have anything extra that you need to be aware of as a nonprofit. So um, that is how we operate as a platform. We work with our National Donor Advised Fund, and we do have um, we, we have solicitation permit permits and the necessary registrations in all 50 states. But it's always a good idea just to check in with your nonprofit's lawyer if you have any questions, just to make sure that you are doing your due diligence. Um, so. Sharon, if you have anything to add to that, please, please pipe in. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I am an attorney, but um, I don't have enough specific information about anybody in the audience um, to be giving you legal advice, but I will tell you this. As we reviewed during my presentation, it is the act of asking that triggers the need to register. So you, nonprofit, are asking even though the method you're using to ask uh, is the wonderful Mighty Cause um, platform, you are the one soliciting funds. Um, and because you are soliciting funds, you are obligated to register or seek exemption in all states where you're asking. Um, this isn't a, a way out to use a fundraising platform you are the solicitor um, of funds, so uh, you are obligated. And there are a number of states that have very specific information uh, about nonprofits using platforms um, that explains that. Um, so uh, you need to take a look at your own registration status um, uh, and where your current donors are located, where your prospective donors, the donors you're soliciting are located. Because remember, it's not where you're receiving funds from. It doesn't matter if you get a donation or not. Um, it, the re registration requirement, the state registration requirement is the act of asking, not the act of receiving donations uh, for the most part, uh, ex with the exception of California, okay? Thank you. Yeah, I'm not a lawyer, so uh, my standard response is if you have any questions, ask your, your lawyer because yes. I'm not able to advise you. Yep, and the same here. Uh, you know, without knowing the specifics of each individual nonprofit and where they're currently registered and if they're entitled to an exemption and all that information, um, I absolutely um, couldn't provide you with more information, but I want everybody to understand that um, it's the asking that triggers the need to register in a state. So if you are asking uh, in a state, you, you in all the states, uh, all those 41 jurisdictions, with the exception of California, um, you generally need to register before you begin asking for money. And it doesn't matter whether you get a gift in it, it response to that solicitation. 
Great, so there's a lot of questions. I know at this point we've gone over, um, and part of that was me babbling about text to give with questions. So I'm just gonna try to pick through um, the remaining questions and just sort of pick out the ones that I think would be really great to answer. Um, and then if there are any more questions, you can always send them to me. Um, Linda, if you have a question about text to give specifically or Mighty Cause, and then Sharon's address is up there on the slide as well if you'd like to reach out to her individually to talk about you know what your question is um, but we'll, we'll just try to find the uh, most um, interesting questions that might uh, be enlightening to everybody else here um, so this one I think is interesting uh, do you know if there are penalties traditionally involved if a nonprofit has been fundraising for years but has not registered as a charitable organization with the state so harbor compliance our collective experience we have i don't know 60 employees and we've been around uh for eight years now is that we have not had any of our clients face fines or penalties if they are proactive and go to the state and say whoops we just now realized um, we should have been registered and we weren't we'd like to now be registered um, and work it out with the state. We have not, our experience has been, we have not had a client face fines and penalties. Um, but yes, in um, many of the states, um, there is a possibility um, of those things being imposed, uh, but um, our experience is that um, if you're the one that goes um, to the state and talks to them, um, uh, as a legitimate charity doing good work in their state, um, they are happy to um, work with you to tr try to work through that. Um, cool, so there, there's a couple of questions about this topic. Um, so uh, how is donor, donor location determined? Is it residents, where their cell phone is? How do you um, determine where a donor is actually located? Uh, it, it's, it's usually where they, where, the state um, where they're located. So uh, it, people, many of donors um, have multiple homes uh, and the rules over uh, whether that state um, is there to protect the people that are there as temporary residents or visitors or permanent residents um, uh, really needs to be looked at state by state by state. Okay, that definitely makes sense to me. Um, so this is an interesting question that came up a couple of times. Does a state incorporation qualify for the state rep uh, registration? Uh, no, your incorporation uh, in a state um, isn't the same as your registration. So if I start a nonprofit um, in um, the state of Pennsylvania, um, I still have to register um, with our Bureau of Charity officials and file annual reports, um, even though I am a uh, Pennsylvania um, corporation. The, your corporate status isn't the same as your licensing to fundraise, your fundraising registration. Awesome, okay, one last question, um, and then we'll wrap things up. We'll send out the recording and the slides to everyone, so if you need to refer back to any of this information, you'll have that recording. Um, but the last question I'll take is, um, or send to Sharon, I should say. If somebody finds our website and decides to donate, but we did not actively solicit donations in their state, do we have to be registered in the donor's state? To accept that donation in, uh, I believe every state but California, you can certainly accept that donation since it wasn't in response to a solicitation. Um, however, if you follow up with that donor by sending a thank you letter and putting a envelope in it to get them to solicit, if they get added to your mailing list and your solicitation list and get ongoing requests from you, um, then you may need to be registered in the state. Um, so you can see the danger in that of trying to exclude, you know, certain donors in certain states from accepting, um, you know, uh, from your uh, follow up with them.
And that sounds like a great um, argument in favor of making sure that you are managing your donor list. Um, you know, know, know where your donors are coming from, where they're located, um, and stay on top of that. You know, don't just dump everybody into one uh, follow-up journey in your email marketing program. Like, pay attention if you need to exclude people from receiving the follow-up or put a delay in there. Um, you know, make sure that you're taking those precautions so that they're not just dumped into a big list of all of your donors. You can use email marketing programs like Constant Contact and MailChimp and Autopilot and Campaign Monitor. Um, I'm a marketer, so those are there's ways that you can, um, if you have automated processes in place, which are fantastic, um, make sure that you're managing what you do with the, the email addresses that you get, the um, addresses that you get from donors and that you're managing your list. Um, and I'll just and on one final plug, we do have a CRM tool for that with Mighty Cause Advance that can help you sort of figure out where everybody's coming from and keep better track of, you know, where your donors are located, who they are, where they live, and so on. So, um, Cool. So thank you, Sharon. Uh, I'm glad we were able to get you on and get our technical issues smoothed over. Um, I will go ahead and uh, once this is uploaded to YouTube, I'll send everybody a recording. Um, Sharon will also have a recording in the slides to send out as well. So uh, yeah, everybody will have access to all of it. Thank all of this. Thank you guys so much for everything today. Uh, I know you stayed, uh, there's a lot of people who are still on and it's been an hour and a half, so thank you for your patience. Um, and Sharon, thank you so, so much for all of your, your wisdom and um, all of your helpful advice. Oh, thank you for having Harper Compliance um, present with you. It's a pleasure to be here and um, talk to your folks. Absolutely, I will take care of everyone. Happy fundraising. <laughs>